What's up, everybody? It's Brandon from Box Office Banner and Cult Flick Symposium, and I am here to talk some John Wick. Yes, John Wick is once again upon us. We had chapter one, we had chapter two, we had chapter three, and we all wondered, could it be a trilogy or would they keep pushing this thing and possibly run the risk of running it downright into the ground? Well, I'm excited for chapter four. I was that guy that I was, you know, after three, I was like, man, I'm kind of worried if we're going to keep pushing this. I was that guy, and now I'm eating my own words because I'm just fucking so excited for Friday. I'm actually going to have to see it on Saturday, so that review will get to y'all a little late. But I thought to myself, why not jump back in, see if my feelings on the first three have changed or differed at all? So without further ado, let's jump into it. All right, here to talk about this bad boy right here, John Wick. I saw this movie in theaters. I was there opening night. I've always really liked Keanu Reeves. I'm a huge fan of like the old school action star. There's been so many like rinse and repeat action movies that have been going on for the last really like even 20 years, maybe even beyond that, where we have really been void of like a face. You know what I mean? Like we have Jason Statham. He's kind of like more of a face. But even then, for me at least, he doesn't hold a candle to the goats for me. You know, like the Schwarzeneggers, the... Stallones, the Van Dams, even the Steven Seagulls. Yeah, I said it. Love those guys. That four a grouping of four people just took over my childhood. And then you have the martial arts guys that were faces too, like Jackie Chan, of course, Jet Li, those kind of guys. We kind of got that with Donnie Yen and, you know, Tony Ja, those type of people. But even them, they're not as main frame. You know, like Jet Li and Jackie Chan came over and took over America there for a little bit, and everybody knows them like the back of their hand, whereas somebody like Donnie Yen, Tony Ja, if you're not deeply entrenched into the martial arts community, you might not even know who they are. So we are missing faces. And one thing about Keanu Reeves, hearing about him coming into what, you know, we didn't know it was going to be a franchise, but an action movie that looks like the part of like an action movie that, you know, might not just be a one-off. Like the trailers really sold me on it. And when I saw like the immediate scores from like Rotten Tomatoes and shit, I was like, oh shit, this might actually be good. But I had a weird feeling about this one that maybe, maybe, maybe we might have something. Because let's, let's look at Keanu. He is a face. Speed, I know there were sequels, but it wasn't, you know, Keanu Reeves and Speed 2 and all that shit. But That's one of the biggest action movies of the 90s. Keanu Reeves, a face in that. We're talking about Matrix, the face of the Matrix. Even like another big time action movie, even if it was just in the first one or or was one movie, Point Break. He's got some credentials under him that makes him a face. And not just a face, a big face. I'm not talking shit on you, Keanu. You don't, I mean, you kind of do have a big head, but I do too, it's okay. Um, Beautiful man, (laughs) not dissing. Um, so I was excited about this, and as soon as I like got in the theater, there was a vibe. Actually, a lot of people turned out, and I wasn't expecting that, and it took off damn near immediately. Like There was a vibe. We hadn't seen any of the action yet, because it's one thing I will praise this movie for. It doesn't like opening scene. You know, sometimes that's fun. They hit you like a club over the head, like, oh shit, Keanu Reeves is back, baby. No, it starts off actually maybe like in a more acting type of vibe, which is kind of weird. I mean, I know there isn't some like crazy powerful performance going on here, but Keanu is losing his woman at the beginning of this movie, and he actually has to cry in a few scenes, which is odd in comparison to other movies because he's so just reserved if he even says anything. So it actually kind of kicks you off in a weird way to where the franchise won't ever go again, it kind of feels like. Even like with the dog, it's like, yeah, it's my dog. Pew, 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 all business. With his wife, it was just... He had to take a moment. He had to breathe, which shows you how important she was to the character, which is great. But it is funny knowing now what would come after that. That's just like, we're not stopping and fucking mourning shit. We're out here killing motherfuckers. Pedal to the metal. Let's go. That is what John Wick is. And I love the creative choice by Chad Stahelski to do that. Um, And once we do get, you know, 30 minutes into the movie, we see how crazy this guy can be because of course uh 
I don't know, Theon Greyjoy, anybody from, uh, I forget the actor's name, but you know, the son of Vigo, I think's his name, the main bad guy in the movie that fucks everything up where he's like, it's a nice car, how much? And he's like, everything's got a price in his own language. And John Wick's looking at him just like, not this one, bitch, or whatever the fuck he says. I can't remember verbatim. But like, have you not always wanted to do that, by the way? Just a quick little tidbit. Like when you're at like a restaurant, say like you're at like a Chinese restaurant, Mexican restaurant, whatever, you don't understand the language and you know, like you don't like, let's not be overly paranoid. 95% of the time, they're probably not talking shit about you. Like, look at this guy. You know what I mean? But you know, at, at least some point in your life, you've had somebody just like, he ain't gonna know the language. And they just kind of, you know, say a quick remark. To be able to be that guy is just like, come right back at him and say in their language, and they kind of like, oh, oh, oh. they kind of quip up like, really? He just, he knows that. <laughs> always want to do that. So I always love that scene. I love when they do stuff like that in movies. And then Th- Theon Greyjoy. So that's all I'm gonna call him the rest of the way. Uh, just set John Wick back in motion. And thank God he did by killing his dog, the last gift from his wife. And just to see the way they slowly kind of, you know, revealed it. You thought he might be kind of badass. You're like, oh, this guy's giving me a vibe, but he gets his ass kicked, which you really don't see much of again. I mean, a little bit here and there in this one, but he almost becomes invincible, it seems like, after the fact, <laughs> once we get there. But like 30 minutes into this movie, the way they're hyping it up, the way Theon's dad is just like, man, (laughs) do you have any idea what you've done? The way they slowly peel that back and we finally get to see it 30 minutes in, I've always really relished and appreciated the way they did that. And uh, let's just talk about the action. This shit, again, it's not just the face. It's also we've been void of any competent enough film director, at least in the mainstream, it seems like, that has been able to do a nice, like, wide pan shot, you know, where it's not shaky cam. That shit took over, and it made action movies even worse, debatably. I don't even know if it's debatably, because, like, there was some good action movies that really heavily utilized it, like the Bourne movies, but the action in it of itself was too much. It gives you a headache. You don't really like it. Sometimes, you know, in different spurts, it can kind of give, like, an intensity to it, but when you're relying on shaky cam the entire way dude like if at all i'm even giving it too much you know credit probably it just you're gonna not have a very good action movie you might have people go see your movies but that's because everybody's doing it so they got to pick from something we are action fans at the end of the day but when you put something like john wick into the picture that's why it's able to be as successful as it is now it just it took you on a different direction it took you on a different magic carpet ride and next thing you know Guess what? John Wick's the best fucking shit right now because nobody was smart enough to just realize to do a normal shot scene that was wide where we could see everything that was going on and watch a face. Yeah, not just some random guy, but you dial up all the money Michael Bay style special effects and shake that fucking camera around to make it look more intense. You have a guy that looks like he knows what he's doing through and through. You believe him and it's shot properly. Who would have thought? God. I don't know what we were thinking, but uh, we at least have John Wick, and I think we're getting a little bit better. Not completely, which is sad. I mean, come on, guys. It's like you get these copycats of John Wick, but they don't understand what makes it work. You know what I'm saying? It really, really frustrating in that regard. But a big reason why that works is because of Chad Stahelski. Funny thing is, I still don't think a lot of people know this, but like this guy has a big time background in martial arts. This is a guy that was like a stunt man in, in Hollywood. He even, funny enough, one of Wick's probably best foes in terms of like squaring up with him. You saw the way he fucked him up in that nightclub when he went after Vigo's son, Theon Greyjoy. We're just gonna call him Theon Greyjoy the whole time. You know what I'm talking about, right? Um. <laughs> When he went after him and like, you know, I guess Vigo's main like little hitman kind of guy, you know, next man up, you know, the muscle that fights for the boss. He fucked him up. And that guy goes by the name of Daniel Bernhardt, which is the guy that succeeded, I guess would be the word for it. The guy that, you know, took the place of Van Damme going forward in the Bloodsport movies. So Bloodsport or Kickboxer? Jesus, I'm doing terrible here. No, Bloodsport. So... This man, <laughs> Daniel Bernhardt, now he's B-grade Van Damme. He's B-grade action star. But I will say the dude's always had a lot of skill. Like him or not, oh my God, Van Damme's not in the sequels, I don't care, or not. 
Dude can fight. And guess one person he fought in Bloodsport 2? Chad Stahelski. They have a legitimate match. And now, all these years later, Stahelski's directing this new best action franchise. And he's going to fucking recruit Daniel Bernhardt, who is a badass. All these years later, them two fighting in Bloodsport 2, coming full circle to now. It's really cool if you know that background and you kind of grew up with those movies and that type of thing, seeing that, whereas an average action fan might just be like, oh, like this guy's got to give John Wick a run for his money, not realizing what they're seeing. Very cool. I always love that about this movie. But that is the key on why it's so good. Stahelski knows martial arts. He knows how to fight. He was smart enough to give Keanu a martial arts style that was not too much for him. He doesn't need to be throwing high kicks. Maybe like he became more limber and did things like that in the matrix, but now he's of older age, have him do this thing that, you know, peg is gun foo where he's fucking shooting people at will loading clips, making it look easy. You've seen him like on Facebook and shit in those training courses, have him go crazy like that. And then give him a more basic type of martial arts where he just has to fucking flip people over. You know, he almost like chops them sometimes and he's slamming people and he's putting them in arm bars. You don't have to give him all these extravagant spin kicks and shit because he don't need to have that. Stahelski dumbed it down and made it better for the actor. And John Wick was all the better for it. Now, it sounds like I'm raining praise all over this movie, which I am because it's, you know definitely worthy of that especially in comparison as i've said to the other action movies of the day that we got but this movie how linear focused how just perfectly done especially in comparison really shines bright but there is a few negatives i guess for me they aren't even really negatives i think it's more of just like because i know what they got i'm seeing what they got firsthand and they're like they're still hitting singles or hitting doubles but there's a few times where they left some home runs in the stadium i'll say that there's little things like for me daniel bernhardt who gave fucking john wick the business in the club their next fight that they did i did not enjoy it as much i wanted to see more out of that and that comes to my next one that wasn't really a home run was the ending the ending where he fights Vigo, like where he squares up with him, goes toe to toe. I just never believe Vigo is that guy. For me, Vigo's like the right hand guy that kind of gets fucked up at the end, might like, you know, talk some shit out of nowhere, you know, but he's not going to fight him. He's not going to do anything of that nature. He's going to rely on that right hand man. And once the right hand man's gone, and again, not in an incredible fashion, he's just kind of like a silly fight compared to the first fight, at least. Didn't really give Wick as much of trouble, uh, you could say. Then you get to see Vigo just go toe-to-toe with him, and it just doesn't feel... Like, I don't believe Vigo in that moment, and that could have been reserved, you know, for the right-hand man if he would have made it to the end finale. They could have had the battle, and then Vigo maybe pulled some bullshit and stabs Wick. You could still have all that and have a more rewarding fight. That's really, really what they needed to do there, in my opinion, and that bothered me. But I'm also surprised to Helski didn't do that. But maybe, you know, he got in his own head where he's just like, shit, maybe I'm giving my boy Bernhardt too much shine, you know, like where you don't want to like, you know, you want to take your friends with you, but you don't want to fucking take your friends in front of not, not the real actors, because like Bernhardt's a real actor. But, you know, you don't see him necessarily, like, starring. Like, he's going to get the last fight in a movie, like an action fight scene. He's not going to get a lot of dialogue. You know, maybe he felt like he was stepping on too many toes there and he didn't want to get, you know, too in his own way. But now looking back, it's like, dude, if you could have Bernhardt on that bridge fighting Wick and an absolute slugfest in the rain, and then you have your little moment with Vigo, instead of having them fight it out in a way that I'm just not believing Vigo to be able to do... And, you know, giving John Wick trouble, it just, that didn't work for me. Another thing that I guess didn't really work for me, like Willem Dafoe's character in this, it's not that he was bad. He was fine. I understand it. You know, he's got the fucking contract. He's protecting him. But there's something about Dafoe in this movie that still somehow, maybe it's because I got so much respect for Dafoe that feels somehow unutilized. Maybe would have got that if he would have survived and went into other movies, but it never felt quite complete to me. And as this franchise goes on, I'm just like, damn, man, I wish I would have got more out of that character. But again, apples, tomato, like, or apples, tomatoes, uh, tomato, tomato, whatever. It's, it's one of those things like it's good, but it could have been better. Then you got, um, I meant to say apples, oranges. I know apples, tomato. what the fuck is this guy talking about? 
Uh, another thing, I think when you initially watch this movie, it's really cool, the buildup of like what the Continental is and everything that's opened up in this world. But when you go back and rewatch it, the scenes where John Wick's not John Wickin, I guess you could say, where he's not fucking people up left and right, it does weigh on me. I don't want to say weigh like to the point it throws me out of the movie, but I'm not as engaged. And I think that's because... It's really cool at first as a build-up type of thing on first viewing, but once you've seen everything the Continental's like capable of, how deep this world is, how like entrenched in society and as its own thing it is, like it's it's pretty fucking unreal and special. And it's almost like when the killing's not going on, I'm trying to fast forward to those parts when it's more fully realized. Where like the second and third one, I'm like, yes. Whereas on first watch, love they did it that way, but when I rewatch the original John Wick, I'm ready to get to where like that world is completely unleashed, if that makes sense. So when I rate this movie, because it is damn good, I even will say it's great. First time watch, it's 8 out of 10 all day, 8.2 out of 10 all day. When I rewatch this one, I got to say it's like a 7.8 out of 10. But that's like with an asterisk to some way, because... If I rewatched it again for the first time today, I think it would still be the 8.2, but I think it's just being a part of a franchise, things we learn about later, the things that we know this franchise capable of is capable of. When you go back and watch the first one, even though it's amazing, you might even say it's a little more grounded, which I prefer a lot of the time, but not, I guess, in this franchise. It you know, it becomes more flashy. The flair is more there. There's more what I feel a John Wick movie is. Even though there's a lot of that in this movie, it's not dialed up to 11 like in the second one, which I want upon rewatch. So I'm going to have to stick at a 7.8. This is still a fucking really good action movie. It's objectively a great action movie. I have a lot of fucking fun with it. John Wick still fucking holds up. Come on, man. Is it my favorite of the three, though? Dun, dun, dun. Guess we'll find out. Love you guys. Peace.